Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack asked, is rural America relevant today in the nation? In Southern Gardening, wall gardens, walls can provide privacy and beauty. In the markets, corn prices are pressured by the slide in wheat futures, while meat packers are still making money on hogs, but losing dollars on cattle. In the feature segment, the USDA is 150 years old, started by President Abraham Lincoln in 1862. It touches every person in the U.S. every day. Uh, we're still in the research business because ag productivity is key to everything else we do. Uh, but I think he would be impressed with the fact that we now have record exports, American agricultural products going all over the world. Uh, I think he would be amazed how few people in this country produce as much food as they produce. Uh, we are food secure as a nation in large part because of the productivity of American farmers and ranchers and producers. Good day, everyone. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. U.S. Agriculture Secretary Dom Vilsack says he knows one reason why we don't yet have a new farm bill. It's rural America's loss of influence in Washington. Well, Leighton Vilsack told a Farm Journal forum in Washington, D.C. that rural America is less relevant, he believes, in the national landscape. Vilsack says it's time for us to have an adult conversation with folks in rural America. The former Iowa governor pointed out that only 16 percent of the nation lives in rural areas and those numbers continue to decline and grow older. Vilsack said simply being heard is a problem since more than 80 percent of the Congress represents urban areas. He called on rural America to develop a proactive, not a reactive message. He said, how are you going to encourage young people to become involved in rural America or farming if you don't have a proactive message? That's because you're competing against the world now. If you haven't heard about it, you aren't alone. The Friday after Thanksgiving, the U.S. Department of Justice quietly announced it had halted its multi-year antitrust investigation into big agriculture companies like Monsanto. Mike Pearson reports. I'm reminded of President Eisenhower's observation. I think this is a great quote. Um, farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles away from the cornfield. Uh, those words, I think, remain true today. More than 30 months ago, the Obama Justice Department launched its first public examination of alleged antitrust practices in the U.S. agricultural sector. In a series of five workshops across the nation, officials studied everything from packer ownership of livestock to a perceived lack of competition between biotech giants. In a March 2010 workshop in Ankeny, Iowa, cabinet officials and farmers spent hours examining the nature of their relationships with seed companies. The discussion clearly demonstrated the Obama administration was examining allegations that agricultural giant Monsanto operated as a monopoly on products such as its trademark Roundup Ready soybeans. Big is not bad. But with big comes an awful lot of responsibility. Christine Varney, the Justice Department's chief antitrust officer at that time, entered the Obama administration pledging to tackle market concentration complaints and unwind what she called the extreme hesitancy of the Bush administration. After the March 2010 panel discussion, Varney acknowledged that the Justice Department was in the early stages of antitrust investigations, but declined to mention Monsanto or DuPont Pioneer, an underwriter of Market to Market. The Justice Department solicited information from both companies in the process of its investigation. We do not bring a preconceived notion to the table. We do not have an agenda to pursue a result. We are not looking to restructure the economy or companies that participate in the economy. We are looking to enforce the law vigorously and fairly wherever that takes us. Attorney General Eric Holder uh, took it a step further in describing a federal legal, legal team ready to act quickly. But you should not take from the fact that we're having these meetings 
uh, the fact that we're simply sitting on our hands and then at waiting for the you know the fifth workshop before we decide what it is we're going to be doing. Um, we are active right now. But the bold press conferences and subsequent workshops across the country apparently led the Obama administration to a legal dead end. During Thanksgiving week, more than two and a half years after launching its first workshop, the Justice Department quietly announced it was halting its antitrust investigation. Varney, who vigorously defended the Justice Department's examination of antitrust issues, left the administration in 2011, and Attorney General Eric Holder's future in a second Obama term is uncertain. Monsanto, which loses patent protection on its well-known Roundup Ready soybeans in 2014, issued a public statement last week following the federal government's announcement saying, we're pleased that the Justice Department has closed its inquiry and this issue is now behind us. But the legal wrangling is far from over between Monsanto and rival DuPont Pioneer. Earlier this year, a U.S. district court in St. Louis awarded Monsanto a $1 billion judgment from DuPont citing patent infringement. DuPont is appealing that verdict, and a separate legal case between the seed giants is also brewing. DuPont Pioneer's own lawsuit against Monsanto alleging antitrust violations could reach a jury in fall 2013. Well, it's been said every garden should have a wall. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will give us a look at the landscape of a beautiful walled garden. One of the things I like best about Southern Gardening is we get to explore some phenomenal landscapes. Today I'm visiting a walled garden that has a tropical and Asian flair. As you enter the landscape, the formal atmosphere is obvious. The landscape beds and brick walkways are lined with liriope and neatly trimmed boxwood and Indian hawthorn. There are beautiful plantings featuring various palms, philodendron, and shell ginger. Water combined with well-weathered copper and bronze sculptures play a key role in setting the atmosphere of the landscape. The dominant feature of this landscape is the bronze fountain depicting our native southern magnolia and a life-size great blue heron. There are other fountains creating motion and relaxing sounds. This fish appears to surface amidst a backdrop of philodendron and Washington palm. The other fountain features two herons wading in the shallow water among the sago palm and a juniper pruned into a spiral topiary. And going along with the Asian theme, this copper sculpture is placed under bananas and a gorgeous Canary Island palm. And I really like how the brick walls just don't define the landscape borders. The ornate copper bronze designs that are placed in the porticos make the walls an attractive participant in the landscape. Sometimes our landscape plants have to play backup for beautiful garden sculptures. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says that wall gardens can help you create microclimates. The walls can protect plants and perhaps allow you to grow something that otherwise you might not be able to try. Well, in the feature segment, we talk about it almost every week on Farm Week, but there was a time when it didn't exist. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. President Abraham Lincoln got started. Time now for the markets with Layton and the last uh, crop and supply demand reports of the year out. What about it? They were released, in fact, Tuesday morning. We begin today with a look at the corn and soybean numbers. Also ahead this week, wheat futures experience a sell-off. Those USDA numbers I mentioned are friendly for cotton. And in livestock, at least one analyst has a bullish outlook for the feeder cattle market. As promised, we begin the segment with the new batch of USDA reports released on December 11th. No real surprise in what the numbers had to say for corn and soybeans, but Extension Ag economist John Michael Riley says the fall in wheat prices as a result of those reports has had a spillover effect in all the grains and oil seeds. So let's go into some of the details of this last uh, set of reports for this year. 
Well, uh, the corn and soybean results from the World Ag Supply and Demand Estimates Report weren't really too far from expectation, but the market was actually down a little bit, largely due to wheat coming in. The ending stock number on wheat coming in much higher than expected. Everybody with the drought conditions that are, that are so rampant still in the southern plains, everybody kind of expected uh, production and everything to be lower, but that number actually came in much higher than expected and really pulled down all the other prices. If you look at what the numbers said, uh, soybean ending stocks 130, uh, 130 million bushels. It's right in line with expectation. No change for, or actually 10, 10 lower than last uh, last month. Mm -hmm. uh, use seems to be some increases in exports for soybeans, which is counterintuitive compared to what corn's been seeing. Corn ending stock 647 million bushels. The market expected 663. So that number was lower, but still the market was down because of wheat. Uh, exports for corn have really been trending down here lately. There wasn't a change in the report for exports, but uh, we have been seeing fewer and fewer sales as a result of global uh, economic situation and a strengthening dollar. So mm -hmm. the fact that soybean we, uh, exports were a little higher, that was a, a, a positive, if you will, from the report. Mm -hmm. So really that's the biggest kind of contrast or whatever between corn and uh, soybean was the export number there. That's correct. Way. All right, but wheat was really the headline out of these uh, out of these reports in a way, as far as the the unexpected factor. That's true, and, and with a number with a corn ending stock number being much lower than expected, the fact that it, the market was still down that says something, and, and the reason for that was was really due to the fact that wheat was so much larger than expected. So the uh, reaction negative, as it kind of seems, is more due to the the wheat. Uh, the wheat numbers there as far as what the market reaction is. That's that's correct, but the positive spin might like might take some time to to filter into the market. Okay. So uh, as we prepare for the new year, uh, market is probably going to be about about where it is maybe going going towards the next few weeks. That's true. We here in the United States for sure because we're still kind of just mulling it over thinking about what's what to do next year. Mhm. Mm All right. Doan's commentary describes this week's supply and demand numbers as price friendly for cotton. The USDA cut estimated U.S. production by 190,000 bales and at the same time estimated cotton exports were increased by 200,000 bales. This figures out to be a net reduction in projected U.S. ending stocks. World ending stocks were also reduced in that report on Tuesday. A hardwood lumber supplier along the I-20 corridor in west central Mississippi is providing some employees an unwanted Christmas present. About 80 workers at the Anderson Tully Company sawmill at the port of Vicksburg are being laid off. The Associated Press reports the second shift at the mill is being dropped as of January 4th. Anderson Tully President Richard Wilkerson blames the decision on a depressed housing market. Our trivia quiz this week deals with something you may have inside your home right now, the Christmas tree. The question is about Christmas tree production. How many Christmas trees can be grown on one acre of land? 200 trees or 400 trees or 650 trees or up to 900 trees? You'll find out here in a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on farm weight coming up with a look at the calendar and the second part of the markets. Leighton Span reports feeder cattle look bullish long term, as does the hog market. In the feature segment today, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. A lot has changed since the beginning. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. The 57th Annual Tri-State Soybean Forum takes place in Mississippi in 2012. The date is Friday, January 4th, 2013, let me add. The date is Friday, January 4th. The hours are 8 a.m. to noon. Registration is free and lunch is included. Handling herbicide-resistant weeds, insect control, and marketing the 2013 crop are on the agenda. The 23rd Mississippi-Louisiana Dairy Management Conference is Thursday, January 10th. It will be at its usual location at the Southwest Event Center on Highway 48 East at Tylertown, Mississippi. Hours are 8.30 to 1.30. Managing dairy cow lameness, moles and mycotoxins in feeds, 
federal policies and 2013 market issues are on the agenda. The Delta Ag Expo is moving up a week this year. It takes place Wednesday and Thursday, January 16th and 17th. The location is the Bolivar County Expo Center in Cleveland. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week snapshot. The weaker grain complex is helping to support the feeder cattle market some. Analyst Jamie Kohaki is of the opinion that feeders stay strong through the summer of 2013 just based off of supply. Put in another three to five cents on by spring, not right now. They held together pretty well late this week off the, off the corn, seeing some profit taking. But same here, if you could, you could drop them down before Christmas, you know, two to three cents, I would look to get long. I think we can push here, you know, close to 150 area. Uh, pasture uh, is very, very limited off the drought, obviously. So I, I, I think the feeder cattle do have a bullish scenario longer term going. Meanwhile, the hog sector is another livestock area with a bullish attitude. Analyst Don Rose says it comes down to the fact that the meat packing companies can still make some money on pork, but he says that's not the case anymore with live cattle, at least right now. That's turned into a losing proposition. As we were talking about the uh, Packers losing about $70 a head on cattle, he's still making money on hogs, you know, about five, six bucks a head. So what we think is really happening is the Packer is killing uh, hogs now at a profitable level, putting them in, in cold storage. The domestic demand is a little bit better because of the high-priced beef. So that combination has allowed the upfront hogs to uh, move higher. Actually, December hogs moved to the highest level that they've been since early March. Now in the back months, if you look at it, we haven't gone anywhere for two months, just like the corn market. From April on, the hog market's just been stuck in the same range, same range as corn. Before this week's feature story is the trivia answer for you. The last choice is correct. That would be D. About 900 Christmas trees can be grown on one acre of land. In the feature segment today, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. This year, the USDA is celebrating its 150th anniversary. President Abraham Lincoln signed the USDA into being in May 1862. In his last annual speech to the Congress, he dubbed it the People's Department. Mark DeMarcus John Nichols reports. One year into the Civil War, additional Union troops were rushed to Washington, D.C. to protect the nation's capital from rapidly advancing Confederate forces. With his back against the wall, President Abraham Lincoln struggled to unite a bitterly divided nation. A peculiar time, it would seem, for the president to focus on agriculture. Yet that's exactly what Lincoln did, signing legislation in May of 1862, creating what he later called the People's Department. You know, I think if Abraham Lincoln came back and saw what he began, he would be extraordinarily proud. I'm not sure he would recognize his USDA. We started out 150 years ago with a very narrow responsibility. That was the function. Today, we do so much more. When the Agriculture Department was created in 1862, the United States population was estimated at 31 million people. Nearly half of all Americans lived on farms, and about 90% were connected, directly or indirectly, to agriculture. 150 years later, the population has increased more than tenfold Less than 2% of us live on farms, yet Americans enjoy access to abundant and affordable food. And USDA continues to fulfill Lincoln's vision of touching the lives of every American every day. The most important thing about USDA from my perspective is its reach. Uh, it really does affect every single American every single day, and it also impacts millions of people all around the world. At no time in history did the USDA play a more crucial role in sustaining the nation than during the Great Depression. In the wake of a stock market crash that vaporized an estimated $30 billion in equity, wages declined and unemployment soared. Between 1929 and 1932, the average worker's income fell by 40 percent, sparking a firestorm of home foreclosures. 
By 1934, over one million families had lost their farms. Those remaining on the land endured severe drought that persisted for years, yet commodity prices plummeted. On the southern plains, clouds of dust darkened the skies for weeks in a phenomenon that came to be known as the Dust Bowl. USDA worked with growers to minimize soil erosion, and the conservation programs that conquered the Dust Bowl have played a key role in American agriculture ever since. So I'm proud to say that in this administration, we have a record number of acres engaged in enrolled in conservation practices of one kind or another. All of this designed to, to avoid soil erosion. We're looking at about 29 million acres. $1.8 billion uh, of money goes into the pockets of farmers because of that program, and it allows us to prevent uh, the kind of circumstances we saw during the Depression. In addition to environmental challenges, America's farmers also faced severe economic hardships during the Depression. USDA established marketing programs and price supports designed to stabilize the agricultural economy. But rural citizens still lacked a vital piece of infrastructure that was powering a renaissance in urban America, electricity. In the 1930s, only about 10% of rural homes were wired for electrical power, compared to 90% coverage in urban areas. USDA's Rural Electrification Administration, or REA, tackled the problem in 1935. Seven years later, nearly 50% of U.S. farms were energized, and by 1952, electricity was available to virtually every operation in the country. Urban citizens, of course, also suffered during the Depression. And as the worst economic downturn in history intensified, two million Americans were homeless and hungry. The Agriculture Department assisted the needy by distributing surplus food. To better nourish impoverished children, USDA established what would become the National School Lunch Program. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as Food Stamps, also traces its roots to the Depression. All told, the Agriculture Department administers more than a dozen domestic nutrition programs and the Congressional Budget Office estimates that more than 80% of USDA spending over the next decade will be for nutrition, while direct spending for agriculture is expected to account for less than 20%. But Vilsack stresses the symbiotic relationship of both campaigns. 14, 16 cents, depending upon the study that you look at, of every dollar that's spent in a grocery store ends up in a farmer's pocket. And so when people are suggesting huge cuts in the nutrition programs as a way of dealing with our fiscal challenges, farmers need to understand that's going to take money out of their pockets. Other USDA agencies manage America's national forests, enforce food safety regulations, and support the development of homegrown energy. In the last three years, we've doubled the amount of renewable energy generation in this country. And so the president has been very clear about this. This is the future. This is the future. And so a production tax credit will make sure that we continue to see a wind energy industry in the Midwest and across the country. We'll continue to support solar. We'll continue to support geothermal. We'll continue to support biofuel production. Why? Because it gives us more options. It, it diversifies our energy portfolio. It makes us more secure. It creates jobs. And it creates wealth and income for farmers. Perhaps USDA's most crucial program for producers is the safety net designed to better insulate farmers and ranchers from losses due to weather, market downturns, or other unexpected issues. And by continuing its work in agricultural research, the People's Department also fulfills the vision of its founder, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we're still in the research business because ag productivity is key to everything else we do. Uh, but I think he would be impressed with the fact that we now have record exports, American agricultural products going all over the world. Uh, I think he would be amazed how few people in this country produce as much food as they produce. Uh, we are food secure as a nation in large part because of the productivity of American farmers and ranchers and producers. It's a great department. I have been extraordinarily privileged and honored to be part of it. Uh, and I think Abe would be pretty pleased with what we're doing. For Market to Market, I'm John Nichols. And you can watch this story again on the People's Department on our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch Farm Week stories on YouTube and Facebook. 
We'll also have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well as read the script. That's farmweek.msucares.com. And Leighton, I submit to you, of course, USDA celebrates its 150th anniversary. Land grant universities in the United States celebrate their 150th anniversary. And I don't think you can downplay the impact that both have had on the world. I mean, just in terms of the land grant universities here in the United States, the ag research that has not only made our nation so bountiful in food production, you know, it's also those that's gone on around the world and helped other nations to feed themselves. And then also, sure. if you look at education, a lot of non-ag students go to land grant universities. So the education realm was increased as well. And so I don't really think you can downplay the impact that it's had. In fact, I think it's hard to separate it. to separate that and actually see it come out. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, you'll learn about a Mississippi State University program that goes by the acronym REACH. REACH is establishing a network of commercial farms that demonstrate conservation practices which are not only profitable, but benefit the environment. We'll have highlights from the Mississippi Farm Bureau Federation's annual meeting in Jackson. Okay. Also next week, see how blueberry production is getting more mechanized in Mississippi. In Southern Gardening, don't jump the gun and clean out all your summer plants when it gets cool. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.